Welcome back, everybody, and thank you very much for um, joining us for this panel, which should be very uh, a very interesting discussion. And um, we've already heard some discussion today of the FTC's legal authority to engage in rulemaking to define unfair methods of competition. In this panel, I'm sure we're going to touch on that as well, but we're really going to try to put that to one side and focus a little more intensely on the costs and benefits, the potential costs and benefits of what I'm going to call um, UMC, unfair methods of competition rulemaking. And given the interest of our panelists and some of the, the chapters that they've uh, uh, submitted to this excellent book, which is apparently available at the desk out front, um, we're also going to take some time to discuss how the FTC's recent interest in UMC rulemaking fits in with the current commission's larger competition policy agenda and how competition um, rulemaking might affect the agency itself, so not just um, industry and the public, but also how it might affect the FTC as an institution. Um, let me t uh, briefly introduce myself. I'm Lisa Kimmel. I have the pleasure of moderating this discussion with this very excellent group of panelists. I'm senior counsel and the antitrust group at Kroll and Mooring in Washington, DC. Um, I focus in particular on civil investigations and competition policy, particularly in the technology sector and involving the intersection of antitrust and IP. And before joining Kroll, I spent um, five years at the Federal Trade Commission myself, working as an advisor to the commission, and I spent three years as an antitrust advisor in the chair's office. I have a JD and a PhD in economics from the University of California at Berkeley. And now, let me introduce our really excellent panelists in no particular order. We have Jonathan Barnett, who's the director of the Media, Entertainment, and Technology Law Program at the University of Southern California Gould School of Law. Jonathan is the author of Innovators, Firms, and Markets, The Organizational Logic of Intellectual Property, published by Oxford University Press in 2021, which sounds very interesting. I'm going to look at that. Um, okay, available on Amazon, all right. Um, Jonathan specializes in intellectual property, contracts, antitrust, and corporate law, publishes regularly in scholarly journals, including the Harvard Law Review, the Yale Law Review, Journal of Legal Studies, uh, Review of Law and Economics, and the Journal of Corporate Law. Jonathan graduated magna cum laude from the University of Pennsylvania, and he holds a Master of Philosophy from Cambridge University and a JD from Yale Law School. Thank you very much for participating in the program, Jonathan. Uh, to my immediate left is um, a man who needs no introduction. This is Jim Rill, and he is one of America's foremost antitrust lawyers and a mentor to at least half of the antitrust bar in Washington, D.C., including, um, including me. Uh, Jim served as Assistant Attorney General in charge of the U.S. Department of Justice, Justice's Antitrust Division, as well as Chairman of the ABA's Antitrust Section. During Jim's tenure as Assistant Attorney General, Jim negotiated the U.S.-European Union Antitrust Cooperation Agreement of 1991 and issued the first FTC-DOJ Joint Horizontal Merger Guidelines in 1992 which I'm, I will extemporize and say I think launched sort of the modern economics of merger analysis uh, as an agency policy. In 1997, uh, Mr. Rill was appointed by Attorney General Janet Reno and Assistant Attorney General Joel Klein to serve as co-chair of the U.S. Department of Justice's International Competition Policy Advisory Committee. Jim's work on that committee ultimately led to the establishment of the International Competition Network, what we all know as ICN, in 2001. Today, that I, today ICN counts more than 100 nation, nations as members, and together with non-governmental -gov advisors, including Mr. Rill, works to create global convergence on antitrust law and policy. And I think, again, extemporizing, I think one of the um, original missions was to try to export some of the U.S. Um, uh, economically grounded principles internationally, but I don't know that trend may be reversing, Jim. You might have something to say about which way the, uh, the convergence is going at this time. We tried. <laughs> okay. Um, Aaron Nielsen is a professor of law at the Reuben Clark Law School at Brigham Young University and of counsel at Kirkland and Ellis. Aaron lectures and writes in the areas of administrative law, civil procedure, and federal courts. 
Uh, Aaron serves as chair of the Administrative and Management Committee of the Administrative Conference of the United States. He also serves on the Council of the American Bar Association Section of Administrative Law and Regulatory Practice. Aaron served as a law clerk to uh, Justice Samuel Alito of the United States Supreme Court, Judge Janice Rogers Brown of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit, and Judge Jerry E. Smith of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit, and he received his JD from Harvard Law School and an LLM from University of Cambridge. So we have two Cambridge alums on this panel, is that right? Okay. Okay, and Aaron, I mean, we, I think all our panelists have some background in administrative law, but I think Aaron is our designated administrative law expert. Um, last but definitely not least, we have Henry Sue, who is a partner at Bradley Arendt Bolt Cummings LLP, resident in the firm's Washington, D.C. office. Henry has a trial and, appellate, trial and appellate practice that specializes in disputes involving antitrust, intellectual property, and technology, and Henry leverages over 20 years of accumulated courtroom experience litigating a wide variety of cases around the country. Um, Henry also spent six plus, is a former FTC colleague of mine, he spent six plus years at the Federal Trade Commission where he served as a competition advisor to former Commissioner Tom Rush and former Chair Edith Ramirez. Henry also spent time working directly on enforcement matters as an attorney in the Bureau of Competition. Um, today Henry draws on his six plus years of FTC experience to counsel and represent clients in matters involving government agency and government relations. So thank you all for, for being here. And I want to note that um, each of our panelists has contributed a chapter <laughs> to the, this book, which I thought was forthcoming, but I guess it's out, on FTC rulemaking, which is edited by Dan Crane and has been discussed through, and will continue to be discussed throughout the day. So each of these folks have, have drafted a chapter and contributed, so they've really thought about these issues. And um, I'm looking forward to hearing what they have to say on um, this very timely topic. So with that, any corrections to my intros that anybody wants to make? No? OK. All right, so let's get started and start out with a focus on the costs and benefits. And um, Aaron, I'm going to start out with you if you could kick us off, and then hopefully everyone else will just jump in. In many contexts, administrative law scholars generally prefer rulemaking to adjudication. Yet here, there's a lot of skepticism of FTC rulemaking. Setting aside the FTC context in a broader picture, what are the advantages of rulemaking? And given those advantages, is the FTC context different, and if so, why? Yeah, so one thing that's interesting to me, I started out my career as an antitrust lawyer. Um, my first job was working at the Federal Trade Commission, um, and then I became an appellate lawyer and then an admin law person. Um, so I, I guess I departed from the true faith. I'm not, I'm not sure. But it's interesting, as I compare um, the discussion in other agencies to the FTC, uh, and that is, in other agencies' uh, context, rulemaking is what people push for. That is true for uh, like median law professors. It's true for conservative law professors. That is the position. And the reason that people like rulemaking in general, um, there's a bunch of them. Um, one is that rulemaking is, in theory, um, more democratic. Um, you have more people involved in the process. Um, it also has greater expertise. Uh, sometimes the agency doesn't know what it doesn't know. Um, so if you have a notice and comment process, it learns things it wouldn't have otherwise known about. Um, but there's also um, a fairness component to it, which is if you act by adjudication, uh, it's, it's almost always retroactive. Um, so if you're making new policy by, uh, by, by adjudication, uh, you're telling somebody, even though maybe you didn't know this was against the, the rules, uh, in fact, you did violate the rules, and there's a punishment, a sanction attached to it. Um, which the D.C. Circuit in one of the cases said kind of has an animal farm-like quality to it um, as you change the rules on the, on the wall. Um, rulemaking doesn't do that. Rulemaking is prospective, uh, right? So you see the rule and then it goes into effect afterwards. So there's, your fair notice concerns are alleviated. Um, so as I go to these conferences and I hear the folks, it's backwards. It's not how we usually talk about administrative law. It usually is people are saying, well, we want rulemaking and we're wary of adjudication. Um, we're going to talk a little bit, I think, today why I think that the, the backwardness isn't as strange as it might first appear. Um, some of it is just because the FTC has, Section 5 is such broad authority um, that the idea that you get rulemaking to that scares people, I think, understandably. 
Um, but I think that's the, the benefits of it in theory is it's more democratic, um, it's better for information forcing for the agency side, and it doesn't have the unfairness associated with retroactivity. Of course, let's share the mic. Let's share the mic. Okay. So, um, so what about the why? Then why the why the concern? I mean, you said FTC rulemaking scares people. <laughs> what what's scary about it? Uh, all right. Uh, well, I think uh, one of the things that I think is scary as I look at it is it is the scope of Section Five. Um, Section Five is one of the broadest <laughs> statutes that there is. It's like, don't go forth and do bad things. Um, without any description of what counts as a bad thing or not. Um, so people say, wait a minute, that's almost like the classic, um, you know, there's a Professor Gary Lawson, the Goodness and Niceness Commission is his idea. Um, if you could just do anything with that authority. If you could really just go forth and make rules about this, untethered to what we've kind of done through with courts and, and those kind of constraints, it just feels like it's too much power in one agency. If the FTC had a narrower grant of substantive goals, I think people wouldn't have the same heartburn about it. Another issue I think that comes along with it is that we see that um, the FTC hasn't done this historically, and it's not like it, nothing's happened. Courts have built up, you know, generations of law in this space. Um, so there's folks who are really good at, at administrative law or antitrust, antitrust law, and now you're like, well, wait a minute, if we can throw all of that out, like Dick was saying, that seems unlikely to happen, um, but it's not because it's you know, unthinkable, it's because people have done this for a very long time and we have law in place. Um, so if you come back to the other, like awesome authority and a long tradition of how this works, I think people are just very wary of, of what that would look like. Does this one, does this one, does this work? It is, yeah, it yeah, works. Good. Okay, good, okay. All right, and does anybody, Henry, do you have a, do, do you, I, I just wanted to add something though, section five, as an enforcement you know, tool through adjudication um, you know, provides for prospective relief. So it's not like people are gonna be punished for right. committing an unfair method of competition that they did in the past that they, did, that they didn't know anything about. So it is prospective. So in that sense, I mean, you know, it's not as scary to, go, to go through adjudication. That's right, that's one, another way that the FTC is just different. The FTC, I was joking earlier with Henry, it's almost a dinosaur agency, not in the sense that it's old fashioned, in the sense that it's older than all of the other agencies. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of the tools that it has, the, the way it is designed, um, are just different than the ones that came afterwards when you get the alphabet agencies and you know the New Deal or whatever. You start to get more standardization. The FTC is just a different animal. Um, so it's true, like section five, it's a prospective remedy. Well, that's not like EPA or some of the other agencies. It's just a different type of agency. Jim? I think it's important to try and focus on what we're talking about here. I think what we're talking about is the proposal by, by Chair Khan and uh, her former colleague, Commissioner Chopra, to in, in, invoke or impose legislative type rules. That is rules that would have the force and effect of law. Regardless of what the precedents might be, what the, uh, what the, even the Supreme Court has concluded to be the law in a particular unfair competition case, the commission would say, sorry, we just attribute a, a legislative rule and that's now the law. That I think is the type of trade regulation rule we're talking about now. Not talking about guides. We're not talking about procedural rules. Whatever good can be said about, gui about uh, rulemaking guides, I'd like to say, for example, horizontal merger guidelines, serve a real purpose uh, for, uh, for clarification and persuasion, but are not, uh, but are not uh, conveying the force and effect of law. In fact, as uh, Judge Jackson said with respect to the 82 guidelines, we view those as a statement against interest by the Department of Justice. Um, that's quite different from the power that I think uh, Chair Khan and, uh, and, uh, and former Commissioner Chopra are looking at in promulgating rules at the FTC, which are rules that would have the force and effect of law. And I think certain very, very, very different considerations apply, not only to the legal issues covered by the last panel, whether or not they could do it, but also the, uh, the policy question of whether or not if they have the legal authority, it's a good idea for them to do it against the great body of law that's been built up in the antitrust area through the process of adjudication. 
Yeah, if I could uh, just just build on those comments, uh, I think the 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 risk here in terms of regulatory overreach uh, derives not just from the fact that you have a administrative agency exercising a function that is traditionally attributed in the separation of powers to the legislative branch, uh, but building on Aaron's comments, it's relying on language in the statute which had previously been, been defined narrowly in the 2015 statement and had been anchored to decades of case law that had used a mixture of legal and economic analysis to provide predictability to the market. So what happened in the, uh, in the July uh, 2021 meeting is that in one fell swoop, the commission decoupled Section 5 from decades of case law, even more decades of scholarship that had preceded the Sylvania decision and everything that came with it, and then methodologically uh, took the position that um, in subsequent statements that it could use its legislative-like rulemaking powers to, to, um, to decide what is, what is unfair. Uh, I'm, I'm sure everyone in the room is aware, but in the explanatory statement in the withdrawal of the 2015 statement, agency leadership explicitly states that under their understanding, Congress gave to the agency full discretion to determine what is unfair. It's very, very hard to square that with our idea of an agency as being tethered to the scope as set forth by the legislature. Um, let me, I'm going to go a little off our question. How, how does it, I mean, most antitrust statutes are, are, are drafted with very broad language, such as the Sherman Act. And, you know, so it's not, I mean, unfair methods of competition isn't any, more vague than you know, unreasonable re restraint of trade. I, I understand your point about there being decades of case law. What, what, what does anybody have a prediction? What would happen if the FTC tried to write a rule that say, you know, over, you know, was contrary to a Supreme Court precedent? Like say their 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 longstanding interest in getting presumptively unlawful standard for reverse payments. What what would happen if they tried to do that as a rule? I mean, could they do that, or would that or would that just get struck down? Does anybody have any thoughts on that? Is that, is that the one that I was supposed to take? Yeah, please, okay. go ahead. <laughs> all right, well, for, first of all, I, mean, I, was, I do want to thank uh, Concurrence and CCIA for putting this on and inviting me to speak and to contribute to the book. Uh, so, yeah, you know, I gave the activist example some thought, and I know Marina talked about it this morning as well. And it's, what's interesting is that before activist was decided, back in 2009, uh, Scott Hemphill had an article, I think it was in Chicago Law Review, or no, no, Columbia Law Review, about this idea that, that, of rulemaking. What about rulemaking for, you know, pay for delay or what we call reverse payment settlements? Because if you have a lot of data on settlements, wouldn't it be more efficient for an agency to, you know, take that data and turn it into a rule, right? And, and one, of the one of the things he cites about why rulemaking might be a better vehicle is that if the agency in t just takes its research and gives it to Congress, you know, Congress or, or gives it to a court, they might get it wrong. They might misunderstand what this was all about. And, and so why not let the agency do its work first and then hand it over, right? But the truth is, is that that logic applies to part three litigation. This was Maureen's point from this morning, right? So what the agency could have done, rather than going to federal court with these you know, reverse payment settlements, they could have done their own part three case, right? Laid out the analysis, laid out the, the empirical data for why these reverse payment settlements are anti-competitive, and then given that to the appellate court for review, which is exactly what's happened now recently with impacts. The impacts case involving the Opana, Opana uh, drug, it, w it went through part three, then went to the Fifth Circuit. And if you read the Fifth Circuit's decision, the Court of Appeals had little problem affirming the work. There was clearly a lot of work that went into that commission decision, right? And, and that's a model for why I think, you know, the adjudication method works, may, may actually work better than rulemaking. And I also, to answer your question, I think after activists, I have a lot of trouble 
saying that we can use rulemaking for reverse payment because I think, you know, activists basically says, look, rule reason applies. You know, there's no presumptive rule of illegality. You know, you get, you know, the, the, the party who's accused of the conduct, wrongful conduct gets to show, gets to show that there are other reasons, other justifications for this payment. And I just don't think that you can, you know, that, that you can go back to rulemaking and try to make a rule that says, oh, you know, 100 settlements, you all have to be treated the same way. I mean, there are different, different reasons why people settle and what, you know, why, they, why they give certain amounts of certain types of consideration for that settlement. So. So, so when you say you don't think you can, you think that a court would, would, would just say that the FTC doesn't have that authority under, the, the court would start defining Section 5, essentially. Yeah, well, yeah I mean, I, I, think, I think, you know, if, if there had been rulemaking, it would have been akin to trying to get a presumptive rule of illegality. And that's kind of gone. That's kind yeah. of gone. I mean, yeah. the Supreme Court said you can't do that. What about for something um, narrower? We know since activists, there's been a lot of litigation on sort of define, you know, trying to apply activists. What constitutes a reverse mm -hmm. payment? How, would rulemaking have, you know, been a more efficient way to get at some of those answers, or 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 or, or not? What's your view on on whether it could have been a complement essentially to adjudication? It can it can be a complement in the sense that the agency can always draw on its experience, right? its enforcement experience, its years of data of saying, okay, we've seen 50 settlements and they all look like this, and this is what's wrong about them, and work that into something like a part three process. So mm -hmm. I, think, I think the complement isn't so much in, in actually coming out with a rule, but it's in drawing on the, ex in, on the, the body of data that you, know, you would also, you know, one might also collect in a rulemaking sense you know, in a rulemaking context, but just drawing that body of data to say, this supports our finding in this one case, so. Does anybody have any other thoughts they want to add on the activists, kind of, these issues, or, or whether rulemaking could ever be a compliment, or does anybody have anything good to say about <laughs> the idea that rulemaking might have some efficiencies <laughs> in, the, in the UMC context? Well, I, I just wanted to walk through the legal steps um, that it would take for an FTC rule to supersede a, a Supreme Court decision. Um, Dick made the point earlier that it just wouldn't happen. Um, that was a real politique argument. Um, there's, a, there's a logical way that it could, in theory, get there, um, but the steps would be, first of all, you'd have to say that Section 5 is not coterminous with the Sherman Act or the Clayton Act. Um, that's itself, there, there's, okay, let's get past that. Then you have to say that whatever the thing that they're doing is, that it falls within the scope of the Section 5 bigger than the Sherman Act. Um, and if you did that, and then they have to say that it's like a, you know, not arbitrary capricious or something like that. Um, so in theory, it could happen. Like you see this all the time in administrative law where um, it's the brand X decision. Um, uh, the court said the law is X. The agency says the law is not X. Um, the statute is sufficiently ambiguous that the agency has discretion to do that, and the Supreme Court upheld that. Now, whether that's going to last, unclear. Um, Justice Gorsuch has a vendetta against Brand X, um, and you know, w before he went to the Supreme Court, so this Brand X is not like on the most firm footing. But to go to the real politique point, there's enough steps along the way that I think the court would be uncomfortable. Um, knocking everything in favor of the FTC such that at the end of the day they say, okay, even though we have all this precedent, we think you're going to be able to win. But conceptually, there's a, there's a path. Um, just if anyone's listening to that who's thinking about that, just be ready for a lot of steps along the way to get there. And probably when you have that many steps, um, probably you're going to lose. And, and I, I would just add, obviously, the current theory of harm for reverse payment settlements is very much grounded in Supreme Court mm -hmm. case law, right? It's Palmer versus BRG. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you know, to, to, to kind of come up with a separate sex standalone Section 5 reason, as Aaron is saying, you, you know, I mean, you'd have to kind of change your whole theory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm taking a look at the, uh, the, this whole notion of it being a more efficient way of proceeding uh, to pick up a little bit on the earlier comment. The commission issues a notice of proposed rulemaking. Presumably that's not challengeable at that stage, but so as the commission issues a rule, there's a question, and we'll see what happens with, uh, with some of the cases in the Supreme Court right now. Can that, can that rule be challenged uh, uh, 
uh, pre-enforcement. You know, maybe that would produce some litigation as to whether that rule could be challenged pre-enforcement. Then the rule is uh, enforced against uh, Company X. Company X says you don't have the authority to issue the rule. So this whole question of the authority to issue rulemaking is again to issue substantive legislative type rule is again before the court. Uh, action suggests that that, uh, that kind of uh, intermediate challenge is, uh, is available. See what the Supreme Court does with action. Uh, let's assume then that the court says, yes, uh, you, you can challenge it, but uh, the, the, they have constitutional authority to issue the rule. Then the next question is, uh, does the rule adequately, accurately uh, define, a, uh, define a violation of Section 5, another element of litigation? Then, clearly, the, the respondent, the, the defendant, has the opportunity to challenge whether or not the rule applies to his or her, uh, to her practices yet another stage of litigation. And that goes up then through the various courts of appeals to a final decision on the, uh, on the application of the rule and the, first, the authority to issue the rule, whether the rule adequately, uh, accurately expresses a violation of law, and whether the rule applies to the conduct of the particular defendant in that case. Now tell me how that is a more efficient way than simply doing it through adjudication. <laughs> I, th I think that uh, segues in, is related to a, a larger point, which is specific to antitrust. So I always start my um, antitrust course by telling my students that most of antitrust are hard questions, right? So outside of price fixing, it's hard questions. I always give my students the example of two gasoline uh, stations located across the street from each other, homogenous product, no brand loyalty. They compete down to the tenth of a penny could be price fixing, or it could just be the fiercest, most competitive market possible. And that's why we use various forms of the rule of reason in all cases outside of the easy cases of collusion. And what that suggests is, and why I think it's related to, to, um, to the previous comment, is that both in formulating the rule and applying the rule, inevitably, an agency that is doing good faith, economically informed analysis is going to have to gather the same types of facts that you would in court. They're going to be subject to the same challenges based on those same complex facts. And so the cost advantage um, is, uh, is, is hard to see. Um, I also don't see how it's more democratic. Agencies are, um, there's, a, there's a long history of agencies uh, being uh, exposed to regulatory capture. Uh, they're far more exposed than core federal courts that have life tenure, and by definition, they're less democratic than the legislature. So I don't see much cost advantage to rulemaking in the antitrust area, and I see it as being less democratic rather than more democratic than either the legislative or the judicial um, option of addressing, of sorting out uh, net efficient and net inefficient practices. Anybody have any other comments on? Uh, I mean, I, we sort of, I mean, I was going to mention, um, but we've already sort of, um, uh, responded to current Chair Khan's um, reasoning for rulemaking, so I think we'll, which was basically the, uh, this idea that it was more efficient and more democratic, and it sounds like none of our panelists really, really agree that it, it is. I mean, I, I, I haven't been involved in some rulemakings my, my, myself on the consumer protection side. They're, they're not quick, that's for sure. <laughs> they're definitely not quick. Um, well, if uh, I could just also sure. add on the, on, the Democrat, on the democratic point, the manner in which the changes have been adopted by the agency during the short time that agency have, have been in leadership have been the opposite of democratic. You had the uh, consumer welfare standard being rejected, the rule of reason standard being rejected, with minimum notice being given to the minority commissioners with none of the traditional sort of listening tour engagement with outside stakeholders. Uh, right now we're in a position where the Section 5 uh, 2015 statement withdrawn, no, de no definition given to the public in its place. Vertical merger guidelines withdrawn, no definition given to the public in its place. Mm -hmm. So with respect to those two key elements of, of, of potential FTC enforcement activity, the public is at the mercy uh, of, the, of the discretion of the re regulators, which they, which they have stated in their explanation of the withdrawal of the 2015 statement, would be exercised responsibly. That is not, that is not a good faith commitment to the transparency of a, of a well-run agency. 
So again, I return to my original point. I don't see how it's more democratic than judicial or legislative um, methods, and the particular manner in which these changes have been made um, have been have been the opposite of democratic in, in the way I, in the way I would define that term. Go ahead. I just um, you know add, adding to what Jim and Jonathan have said about the efficiency. You know, to me, if we want to think about Section 6G rulemaking, right, the best model for kind of what, or best template for what, kind of, what procedures look like are the 1962 rules, mm -hmm. which came out. And mm -hmm. Howard talked about them uh, this morning in his opening remarks. But if you go to those rules, you see that even after a rule has been promulgated, you know, someone who is accused of violating that rule still gets to litigate, still gets to say either, hey, I didn't do this, or this rule doesn't apply to me because of X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're still adjudicating. Yes. And that's the question is, why is that more efficient? Well, I mean, so, to, to play devil's advocate, I think the idea is that it would, it would you know, the, 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 the dispute, the litigation, the adjudication would, would essentially be limited to did you or did you not violate a rule, you know, sort of a black letter law rather than a large, you know what I mean, a larger, so it would define what the offense is, and so it would simplify the adjudication, I think, yes. But um, yes, I, but yes, you would still have to adjudicate. I also um, want to just sort of raise the idea of the remedies. I mean, the FTC has a, you know, it's, I, I, I think I'm correct that if there was a Section 5 rule, the remedies would be the same as, an, you know, a, a violation of a, of a UMC rule, the remedy would be the same as a violation of Section 5, which is a fairly lim, I mean, the, the remedies are limited to injunctive relief, I think, right, unless you violated an order. So they're pretty, fairly, I mean, injunctive relief could be a, a serious remedy because it, it could change a company's business practice. But is there anything about the limited remedies, which I think is part of, you know, what folks have said, why there should be less concern about the, the FTC having discretion with UMC adjudication, Section 5 generally, because it has very limited remedies. And does that affect any of your thinking on, on concerns about rulemaking, the idea that the, the remedies are fairly limited? Go ahead. I mean, I'll defer to Aaron on this, but I thought that one of the arguments about why Section 6B doesn't give the FTC rulemaking power is that there are no remedies, there are no penalties, and that you would want, if you had rules, you'd want penalties for violating the rule. Yeah, okay. I mean, I think my understand, right? my thought is that it would be the same as a violation, because essentially what, what, a, what a UMC rule would be, I, I believe, would, would just define a Section 5 violation. So if you violated Section, the rule, you violated Section 5, and you would get a Section 5 remedy. But uh, yes, I, I would defer to Aaron on that as well. I mean, here's the problem. It's really going to be a really technical answer, and no one's going to want to hear it. <laughs> um, I, I mean, the answer is it depends. Um, and there's major litigation risk about all of this. Um, so you'll see this in other areas of law. Does the agency have the power to preempt state law? Uh, or do they need a specific grant of authority or preemptive authority? Um, can, a state, can an agency create a private right of action? Um, well, it depends on the nature of the organic statute. So these are additional acts of, uh, you know, of judicial review and litigation that we're going to have if the agency tried to do that. So I can imagine a world where the agency said, we're going to create a private right of action. We think the same grant of authority that gives us rulemaking authority extends to this. It's a, essentially enforcing the provisions that already exist. Thus, we're going to create a right of action. And that's going to be a whole other body of law that you're going to come into, whether or not that's going to be OK. I suspect, uh, here I'm more confident that the court would say no. Um, the way that they've been going on finding an agency's creating rights of action suggests that that's a really important thing that you need actions from Congress on. Um, but like, that's like the next level of litigation. So once we get past the first step, can they even do rulemaking at all? Um, if they try to do something like that with their rulemaking power, be ready for a whole other conference on, on what the remedies would, be look, li would look like. Um, and real fast, if I want to say on the democracy point, um, yes, obviously the most democratic way to do all of this uh, would be legislation. Uh, right? Um, as we talk about these things, should there be a right of action? Well, you know what? The courts would say, 
um, even if they maybe you know, hold their nose and eventually rule for the FTC, who knows how that plays out, they would say, shouldn't this be the sort of thing that Congress passes a law about? Uh, wouldn't that make all of this a lot cleaner and easier than us guessing what a, a, a you know, 100 plus year statute means as to this or whatever? Like, but that's not where we are right now, and I think that is a bigger problem for all of us here, is a lot of our administrative law doctrines are built around the idea that Congress will legislate, and Congress just isn't legislating in the space at all. And then we heard from the earlier panel, um, they maybe don't even have the expertise to do it. Um, that seems like a problem. One of the more notable exercises of Congress involvement in uh, antitrust was the passage of the Robinson-Patman Act. So we try that again? <laughs> I think, yeah, the FTC might be trying to. <laughs> we might see some of that uh, again as well. Um, um, does anybody else have any comment? I, 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 I wanted to, this is something that I've been kind of interested in, personally interested in. Um, we know that the FTC do, is, does do a fair amount of rulemaking on the UDAP side. Most of it is done pursuant to a specific statute that's passed and the Congress delegates to the FTC the authority to write the rules and enforce those rules and uh, uh, deal with violations as unfair and deceptive acts or practices. But the FTC does have, and I think people question this far less, they, they clearly have independent UDAP rulemaking authority and that's spelled out in the FTC Act. And it's been rarely used, but it has been used in the past. And um, the, that, that language in Section 5 is unfair and deceptive acts or practices, which doesn't sound to me wildly less, vague, you know, more vague than unfair methods of competition. So is there some reason, and I don't think anyone challenges the, the, um, the legitimacy of UDAP rulemaking, um, is there any difference that we should be thinking about, about why the FTC, why there's so much less concern about UDAP rulemaking than UMC um, rulemaking. Does anyone have any thoughts on that? Well, first of all, Congress drew a very fine line between UDAP rulemaking and unfair competition rulemaking when in, in the enactment of Section 18 expressly stated uh, in the legislative history that, uh, that the passage of Section 18 would not affect in any way whatever authority the Commission may have to issue competition rules under uh, Section 5, unfair methods of competition. So Congress itself drew that fine line. Uh, it seems to me quite, quite plausible that there is a distinction. The types of practices are more clearly defined in the area of UDAP. Uh, you don't have, uh, quite often you don't have the same, maybe you should, but don't have the same economic analysis considerations that you're forged out in the uh, anvil of litigation that are forged out in, uh, in uh, competition, uh, competition cases. So I think there are, there are certainly very plausible uh, reasons why Congress elected to, uh, to limit uh, UDAP rulemaking to, uh, limit uh, Vegas and Moss rulemaking to, to UDAP rules. Uh, because of the, uh, because of the, uh, really the more, the greater clarity uh, and, and less, uh, uh, I would argue, less, uh, less involved uh, uh, proof, less involved economic considerations in, uh, in UDAP rules. Uh, now, again, that was a congressional decision that was made, right or wrong, I don't know. I think in a lot of areas, uh, uh, persuasive guidelines can work out. In the UDAP area, I think of the, uh, the deceptive practice uh, uh, guides that were put out under the, uh, when, when uh, Tim Muris was head of the Bureau of Consumer Protection, which I think were, were very illuminating somewhat controversial, but very illuminated. So what's wrong with doing it that way rather than attempting to do legislative rules? But I think there is a better case for legislative rules in the UDAP area, and Congress seemed to think so too because of the clarity of the type of practice they were dealing with. Does anybody else have any, any, any thoughts on that? Do you think, do, in particular, do you think there really is such a clear, especially in today's, um, in the technology space, is there really a sharp line between what would be a competition issue and what would be a, a potential um, unfairness issue? Yeah, so, so the answer I'm going to give is not an administrative law-based answer. It's rather, it's just an observation, it comes from an observation that Judge Posner made in a case involving United Airlines and the Civil Aeronautics Board, which no longer exists, has been since been supplanted by the FAA. But, but the point is, is that with deception, right, it's easier to draw on common sense and experience to say, hey, look, 
if someone doesn't have this information, they're, gonna, they're not going to have everything they need to make that decision. They're going to be deceived versus unfair methods of competition, which are not only do you have to know about you know, firm behavior, but you also have to know about market circumstances, conditions, et cetera. As Jim was alluding to, it's just a broader, broader inquiry you know, involved than saying that something's deceptive. But, the, but that's what, we, what, we, what we've developed over right. the years. There's nothing in the statute that right, says absolutely. that unfair, yeah. you know, that, it, that that's what an unfair but, but method I mean, of competition is. But I think is. it goes to, but I think it goes to explain why there has been UDAP rulemaking, but only one instance of UMC rulemaking, which was then replaced <laughs> by the Fred Meyer guides. So, you know, again, and, and even the Civil Aeronautics Board. So here's the thing about, and I would encourage you all to read Judge Posner's opinion in, in uh, United Air versus CAB, because CAB had authority under a, a statute, uh, under a sec provision called Section 411 of the, of the Federal Aviation Act, and it, it was patterned after Section 5. So it also it gave CAB power over unfair methods of competition and unfair and decept deceptive acts and practices. But even CAB rarely used that statute to engage in rulemaking. Mm -hmm. I think at the time that the case came before the Seventh Circuit, there was only one other instance that CAB had ever used, you know, used that statute to engage in UMC rulemaking. And it had something to do with interlocking directorates, which is a very different animal than saying that some things, you know, anti-competitive, you know, in, in a market-based sense. What, so. what about something that's up on the table at the FTC now, which maybe maybe doesn't involve really detailed economic analysis, which is um, employing non-competes? What, what are your thoughts on on rulemaking for that, which shouldn't you know may may you know maybe devolves really detailed economic analysis? But we've you know we're saying that you know we're sort of assuming that all unfair methods of competition question, and I'm I'm an economist, so <laughs> the statement against interest involve really detailed market analysis, but but. I think what the FTC is doing and what the Congress is doing is questioning some of the, the density that we've created in, in antitrust law. And as somebody who's, who's studied economics herself for a good bit of time, it does get a bit dense. <laughs> and it gets so dense that maybe you can't, you can't ever bring a case. So what about using rulemaking for, for something like non-competes, which I think the FTC has said they're considering? Okay, so uh, I, I recently published, uh, co-authored co an uh, article in the Chicago Law Review on precisely this topic. Uh, and um, uh, the economics of non-competes are surprisingly complex. The empirical evidence, uh, which is abundant, is largely mixed. Uh, there is a, there, the evidence seems to support a positive incremental, an incremental effect on reducing worker mobility, which is unsurprising. However, taken in the aggregate, the literature does not support the view, which is supported in a handful of studies, which are the studies that were cited by the Obama administration and are now cited again uh, by the FTC. It does not support the claim relationship between non-competes and reduced innovation. You can find tech clusters in states that adhere to the reasonableness standards, that's 47 states, and of course you can find Silicon Valley, which operates under a prohibition in all cases except the sale of a business. So I think non-competes actually illustrate, again, my point that antitrust is hard, Antitrust is better dealt with through case-by-case -case adjudication. That's what the common law has done for hundreds of years through the reasonableness standard. The reasonableness standard is quite stringent. It varies a lot from state to state. That being said, I do agree with the comment made on the earlier panel that there is a, there is a plausible case for rulemaking, assuming that there's statutory authority to do so, with respect to a mandatory disclosure requirement for non-competes to employees and specifically on the timing. Clearly that would be economic and economically efficient mm -hmm. that in the employer-employee contracting relationship, all the information was on the table. But in terms of the, in terms of the substance uh, of, of permitting non-competes, prohibiting, and there's lots of variations in between depending on the state, 
Uh, I do not, I think that that's precisely a difficult case uh, and is not, not um, you're a high risk of error cost if you were to engage in some type of per se uh, rulemaking in that area. So, so have, we, have we gotten to some place where we could say that we see a role for rulemaking in perhaps in, in defining the disclosures in employee contracts? Do we have that? Have we gotten that? Uh, <laughs> yes, subject to, uh, pro subject to proviso one, we uh, have the statutory authority. And, and, and two, there could, there could be, a, I could see someone making a case that the federalism state-by-state -state experimentation uh, that, that predominates over the efficiency you would get from uniformity. But I do, I do grant that that could be, could be an area where there could be a factually plausible case for uh, rulemaking on uh, disclosure of non-competes. And, and in, a, in a, one more, and I'll let you. Mm -hmm. So in a, in a rulemaking proceeding, every, that, that could come out. I mean, if we had a, you know, a commission that was trying to do the right thing, that could be an answer they came up with. That could be a rule they promulgated based Ab on public comment. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. But just one quick observation. Again, with that kind of rule, right, we're talking about people. We're talking about the behavior on people, mm -hmm. not markets, right? We're talking about I, you know, someone as a prospective employee getting a disclosure mm -hmm. before he or she signs on the dotted line. That's very different from a rule about that takes into account market conditions. And could, do you think that could be under, that could be done under UDAP, like a disclosure for employees? Could that be a UDAP issue? Maybe, maybe. Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, all right, great, all right. Um, does anybody else have anything else to any, any, what about on the, um, the other one, which I'm very skeptical of myself, is the um, exclusionary contracting, which is enormously broad, the proposal that's out there. Does anybody have any thoughts on on um, that, I'm guessing based on our, our, all our comments that we all, that this panel thinks that would be a very bad idea. Well, if there's any, if there's complexity in the former topic, there's certainly a lot more complexity in that. And I think that, that, that's, a, that's a very bad, bad case for, uh, yeah. if there is a case, that's a bad case because the economic considerations and that type of arrangement are very complex. Mm -hmm. The efficiency issues are very complex. There's a body of law, a large body of law that's developed around in that area uh, to, to try and fashion a rule in that area with the various facts, circumstances, considerations that might involve, be involved in any particular case, I think would be an exercise in foolhardiness. I don't think it would lead to any clarification. I think it would probably be bad as a matter of public policy. Yeah. I, I'll just add to that. We, we kind of don't need to guess what would happen. You, you, there, you know, there are in, in the antitrust statutes, as we're all aware, there are certain rule-like elements, right? So, so the Clayton Act with respect to tying and the Robinson-Patman Act. And, 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 and what you see is that when the courts try to apply these rules, uh, they encounter exactly these complex efficiencies and in, a, in the court's good faith effort to try and reconcile legislative instruction without wreaking havoc to ordinary business practices that don't plausibly pose any competitive harm, we end up back with a standard, something like a rule of reason. Uh, and again, that's, that's why many of these areas, with the exception we've identified for the disclosure of non-competes, uh, uh, are, are, are likely to be inhospitable to, uh, to rulemaking, meaning we're, we're, we're unlikely to get uh, a net efficiency advantage in, in terms of uh, enforcement costs and in terms of uh, enforcement accuracy through the, through the rulemaking um, uh, avenue. I mean, if I could, I, I don't claim an expertise on this question, but it illustrates something important, which is the broader the rule that the FTC does, let's assume that it does a, a rule like this, um, there's a very rosy colored view that, okay, that means once we do it, it's there. Um, it's gonna get undone. The broader the rule, the more likely it is when the new administration comes in that they will undo it. And the way that we've seen this, if you, if you wanna see how this is playing out, look what's happening right now at the FCC, um, the FTC's cousin. Um, we've had zigzagging policy for almost 20 years on net neutrality type regs, um, where when the Republicans are in power, they do one way, when the Democrats are in power, they do something else. Um, and that's not great for anybody to have zigzagging um, regulation. But what's happening right now at the FCC? Um, the FCC is deadlocked and they can't get the fifth commissioner confirmed. 
Um, and part of that, again, who knows all the ins and outs of the, the senatorial process, part of that is because people know that if the fifth commissioner gets confirmed, then they're going to bring back net neutrality. Um, so there are institutional effects of broad rulemaking. Um, the more the FTC becomes a powerful rulemaker that does really big things, the more zigzagging you're going to get across administrations, and the more attacks, political attacks on the agency are going to be, um, such that you know the confirmation process already isn't something that you know people are thrilled about. Um, it can be a lot worse, um, and I, that's kind of worry when I say, when I say I worry about the institution of the FTC. Um, it's not all good and like no bad. If the more you take the power, the more things that come with it, including lack of consistency across administrations and more, you know, I call it politics as blood sport from Tom McGarity um, as to how agencies are staffed and function and their, and their budgets. And, you know, they'll have in big omnibus legislation, they'll have lines that say, and this particular thing you can't regulate on. Um, it just changes the nature of the institution, whereas the FTC works as ideally five or four votes um, on, on matters, and they go slow, and they do it. That's how you get consistency and stickiness that doesn't change, and you don't have um, just nasty, nasty political fights. Yeah, well, um, I, I, I mean, I, I, agree, I agree with that. I think until recently, the FTC on the and, and DOJ on major things like um, I think we've seen on merger guidelines that if you don't have a bipartisan consensus, it just flip flops. And when Henry and I were both at the agency, things were, were we had we had uh, we didn't do um, uh, uh, there were no guidelines that were passed without um, uh, the, the 2010 merger guidelines were bipartisan, and and that that's clearly a problem when you you know, pass, you know, guidelines that are supposed to give guidance to industry on a partisan basis. It's, I, I, so I agree, I agree with that entirely. And isn't that just maybe... Um, well, let's go back to what we're talking about here. We're not talking about guidelines. We're talking about legislative type rules, rules having the force of effective law, regardless of what the dynamics of litigation have proved or established over the years. I think the case for merger guidelines is quite different. They're persuasive. Uh, I think, well, I have to say the 1992 merger guidelines uh, had a very strong persuasive effect on the courts. Uh, I think uh, very much followed in uh, your polypore case, as a matter of fact. Uh, it was, we were very much followed along the lines of the 92 guidelines. But the case for guidelines, I think, is a strong case. Uh, if they're built on the foundation, the, the, the Gibraltar foundation of the, the, the rocks of a bunch of uh, fossilized litigants, to, to produce to produce a general consensus and then bring clarity to the to the to the to the process. And I think the horizontal merger guidelines, and I won't just say 92, but 82, 92, 2010 have all been very salutary, very positive, uh, very positive uh, activities by the agencies. By the way, acting in parallel. Um, yes, yes. But I, I think, Aaron, I, I mean, I took a larger point, which is any big action by the agency needs to be on a, on a bipartisan basis if it's going to, you know, any, any action, regardless of what it is, any large action by the agency, if it's done on a partisan basis, you're going to see a lot of flip-flopping. And maybe, maybe this is something we're seeing throughout um, government and courts these days. <laughs> yeah, and in fact, I mean, that was one of Marina's uh, Marina's tips uh, was for, you know, was less acrimony. Yeah, right? yeah. Let's, let's uh, make decisions. That's something with... that's changing. Yeah, yeah that's, so. that's an unfortunate change in, 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 the, in the agency. So, um, but perhaps the FTC isn't the only um, part of the government that's seeing <laughs> this sort of hyper-partisan um, bickering. Um, at any rate, let's, um, let's, let's move on a little bit. Um, I'm going to move on. Um, uh, I think we've, we've discussed the costs and the benefits, and I think we're, where we're coming out is there may be a very, very narrow scope <laughs> for some if, if the agency were to have authority. Perhaps there are some narrow circumstances where it, you know, UMC rulemaking or, or ru competition-related rulemaking could have some benefit, but it would be a very narrow circumstance, and we've just identified one here today. Um, but let's talk a little bit, and let's, since we're kind of going in that direction anyway, talking a little broad, more broadly about the political environment around competition policy. 
And this is something I know Jonathan has focused on on his work about, um, when you start think a little bit about the relationship between the chair's embrace of UMC rulemaking and other commission developments. And if I could also bring in some of the, the relationship too between some of the legislation we're seeing in Congress, because it does seem like generally there seems to be a push away from really economically grounded case by case and kind of a backlash against I mean, I think we can all agree that the economics of antitrust can get a little dense and uh, a little complicated and make it difficult to bring cases. So, you know, there, you know, maybe bringing some balance back to that isn't the worst idea in the world, but maybe we're approaching it, you know, um, you know, who knows, you know, we probably all have thoughts on whether any, any of these current proposals at the Commission or the Hill are the right way to go. But um, let me pose a specific question here to you, Jonathan. And the FTC's proposed UMC rulemaking initiative has been launched in the context of other major policy shifts at the agency. And you'd already mentioned, including rejection of the consumer welfare standard in the rule of reason. Uh, what's the bigger picture that, that's going on? And the FTC and on the Hill, too, what's going on here with the sort of backlash against sort of traditional, you know, economically grounded, case-by-case, fact-based um, antitrust analysis. Yeah, sure, happy to take that on. Um, yeah, in, in the, if we want to look at the really big picture and, and, and we look at not, not just the FTC, but what's happening legislatively and, and even what's happening in, in the popular discourse, um, I think there is clearly a divergence between the way antitrust has been understood for decades among antitrust lawyers and scholars and, and regulators, which is a singular focus on protecting consumer, on um, protecting consumers, protecting competitive markets, and the way to do that operationally is through the consumer welfare standard because it can be reasonably objectively measured. And in hard cases, which are all cases other than price fixing, the balancing test recognizing that there, it's difficult to distinguish between uh, net efficient and net inefficient practices. And that took me a long time to say, and people are frustrated with it. Uh, and, and there's lots of terms out there. We can call it new brand ice antitrust, populist antitrust, pick whichever term you like. Um, there's there's a, a, a discomfort with the size of uh, the companies that lead digital markets. Um, there is an impatience with the requirements in antitrust law, again, outside of those cases, large market share means nothing as a matter of antitrust law as we, as we know, unless you can show it's market power. And even that doesn't mean anything unless you can show it was acquired or maintained illegitimately. Uh, I think that is what's driving uh, what we're seeing at the at the FTC, it's a different vision of antitrust. It's it's not the it's not the vision of antitrust that we associate with Chicago. Of course, it's not even it's not even the vision of antitrust that we associate with post Chicago, which does operate through the consumer welfare standard and relies on on balancing tests. It it just applies different weights than 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 the Chicago school uh, to define that generally. If we if we if we we can see suggestions of this in the chair's memo to staff in September of 2021, in the statement of regulatory priorities, in the in the draft agenda, and so we see the word consumer appearing far less. Uh, we don't we don't see only competitive markets, but fair competitive markets. We see language referring to distributional issues. Distributional issues have never been a part of antitrust uh, since at least Sylvania and, and arguably before. So this is a different vision of antitrust. How do you operationalize that? You can't operationalize it through the courts. Uh, the federal judiciary is not tending in this direction. And therefore, we get to our topic for today, which is to try and achieve this um, alternative vision of competition law, antitrust law, through the mechanism of rulemaking, which, uh, which it is hoped would ultimately qualify for deference under the Chevron standard and would therefore be a way to detour around all of the obstacles under the Sherman Act and the Clayton Act. And that's why, as part of this way to operationalize new brand ice, populist antitrust, pick whichever term you like, 
um, it's necessary to decouple Section 5 from, uh, from the Sherman Clayton Act uh, jurisprudence. And so I think that's the bigger picture mm -hmm. of, of, um, of, of what's, uh, what seems to be going on at, at the agency. If, if that's your vision of antitrust operationally, that, that, that's the logical, the logical way to go. Anybody, Henry, did you have some comment? Not, not really, okay. No, not really. I mean, <laughs> I, I, other than obviously I agree with Jonathan that, you know, the way the current administration is seeing antitrust is to kind of re, you know, envision or reimagine what the world ought to look like, what the economy ought to look like. I mean, dealing with issues like, in, you know, inequality, right, rather than just, you know, preserving a competitive process. Well, well, let, let me let me push back on that a little bit. I mean, is there because my my um, you know my my thinking too in what I see in some of what the I, I agree with you the FTC wants to move away from the consumer welfare standard, but 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 in addition there there is I think a legitimate concern with the complexity of that the, around antitrust law, the cost of bringing cases, the time cases, the the cost of economic experts that you see you know that it, that that's you know, there's a cost and benefit to that too. So that some of it is, some of it, yes, is clearly moving away from the consumer welfare standard. But put that aside too, there's sort of a, a move toward creating more presumptions of harm and, you know, sim just simplifying antitrust law. And we see that, I mean, I think that could be a way the FTC goes in rulemaking as well. It doesn't have to define, it could write rules that just, you know, shifted the burden or created a presumption of harm like we're seeing in, in some of the um, some of the proposals on the hill, some of the legislation on the hill, I mean, is there any validity to this concern that antitrust has just gotten to be too complex, and that while we're worried about false, po you know, false positives, that there's is there any? You know, I think some of the um, the post Chicago, you know, had a concern, has had a concern with um, false negatives as well, and that that's. Maybe the difference between the neo Brandeisians and the post, the Carl Shapiro's of the world, who want to stick with the consumer welfare standard, but are concerned with this issue that, that you know, and against his interest because he's the most popular expert out there. That you know, antitrust has just gotten to be, you know, it's too big. You know, we're, we can't get things done because the 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 burdens of proof are just too heavy. Is there anything, any way in which rulemaking might be a useful tool to try to s just simplify the process of bringing antitrust cases? Certainly would be a tool to do that, whether the tool, uh, the tool makes any sense or not. Yes, antitrust is hard work. Uh, and yes, the economic analysis can be very difficult. Uh, but And wrong. Uh, <laughs> Often very wrong. <laughs> well, it can be wrong. It can evolve over time so that it's no longer wrong. I mean, there, there was a time when uh, the, the uh, concentration presumption was a lot stronger than it is right now. Is that a bad direction that the law has taken in mergers? I don't think so. So we do have an evolutionary, uh, an evolutionary aspect to, to antitrust. And yes it, yes, it is complex, and yes, it takes time. But is that worse than some arbitrary rule that's thrown in there without the adequate economic analysis, without application to particular facts, without, uh, without the development of a strong adjudicatory foundation for the, the correct result? Well, well, is that I, the right? Is that the right well, way to do? It? I mean, it's very easy to pass a law saying all mergers are illegal. Not no, easy no, to pass, but yes, I mean, we could well, do that and be clear: all mergers are illegal. Well, what is that about, a sensible way of going? Yes. Well, so I, I, mean, I, I, I mean, what about presumptions I, that have I, some economic? What about shifting? You know, well, if there they was have, some, they, 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 the, the concentration presumption was a hell of a lot stronger uh, back in my day. <laughs> Well, I think it still uh, holds that, in that, court, that, right? That do, do we still from, have that? Do that it evolved from the early house conference through the uh, through through the Chicago school, and indeed through the neo the the, the uh, post Chicago school. The post Chicago school is not throwing that presumption, throwing that presumption back to life. Um, I think we, we we trade off the difficulties involved in adjudication for the for the building of a foundation, the skeletal frameworks, and the foundation of the right answer achieved over time which I think is the, is the benefit of the way things are, are proceeding right now, rather than an absolute rule. How would we like an absolute rule on mergers that throws in the Vons case? 
Would that be your answer? I don't no, think no. so. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just trying to give a little pushback. I mean, I do, I do think that, that, um, that, that bringing antitrust cases, and not necessarily merger cases, I'm thinking in particular about conduct cases, that they, it's gotten extremely difficult, and the economics of it are, are very uncertain. How about a per se rule against vertical restraints? There's a good conduct no, case for you. come on, <laughs> Let me, let me just say, I, I, I agree that, that uh, antitrust enforcement can be well served through things like presumptions, shifting burdens, safe harbors. Uh, I think what's essential, and, and, is, and, and I think you suggested this, that it should in all cases be based on economic analysis. And we have a very vibrant uh, debate among practitioners, regulators around the world, and scholars where that presumption should be. Uh, the analysis is, is, is very difficult. There's a very vibrant empirical debate right now whether concentration levels have, inc have in fact increased, whether market power has in fact increased. But all of these approaches have in common the, effect, uh, in, have in common the fact that they all use objective economic analysis and they're all anchored in the consumer welfare standard. Again, why? Because it's reasonably objectively measurable as distinguished from a standard that says Section 5 includes consumers, but includes a whole bunch of other things which I have not yet identified, and many of which are not amenable to measurement. It's just very difficult to reconcile that. Uh, I go back to one of my earlier comments with, with an agency acting within the scope of legislative um, instruction. But I do agree that, 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 that safe harbors are very important. And, and one other avenue we, sh we, we could to think about, of course, is that we've often operationalized that through the guidelines, right? Mm -hmm. Healthcare guidelines, merger guidelines. These give great signals to the market and they really facilitate um, market planning. Um, uh, and, and perhaps they should be used, used more widely. Anybody else? And just argue with Jim some more. <laughs> we can do that at lunch. <laughs> okay. All right. Let me move on a little bit. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, what is the we, – we've all discussed, I'm sure, at, at other points today, we've talked about um, the court's decision in AMG Capital Management, which was a big blow to the agencies, uh, particularly on their consumer protection side. And I wonder if, if anyone has thoughts on what the court's decision in AMG Capital Management and the court's grant of cert – in the Axon Enterprise and uh, SEC versus Cochrane means for the Commission's recent interest in UMC. And if anybody on the panel maybe can say a few, I, I'm, I'm not familiar with the SEC Cochrane case, I know about the Axon case, but if anybody has, can talk a little bit about that and how you think those are affecting the FTC's thinking on um, uh, UMC rulemaking. Sounds yeah, like that's Aaron's. Yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll jump in here. Uh, and I, I want to add a couple of other cases to that list. Sure. Um, I think Salo Law and Collins v. Yellen um, should be required reading at the Federal Trade Commission um, right now. So these cases are um, cases about the independent agencies. Salo Law was the CFPB and Collins um, was the Federal Housing Finance Agency. I'm well aware of Collins, um, not bragging, I got destroyed, but the Supreme Court appointed me to defend the constitutionality of the FHFA's for cause removal provision and I got two votes on that. Um, and you read what they say about Humphrey's executor in those cases, uh, especially say the law. Um, if, the, if the Federal Trade Commission wants to remain an independent agency, this seems like the worst possible time to be as aggressive as you can with your rulemaking authority. Because the Supreme Court has already put the FTC on notice that Humphrey's executor is not good law and it only is, remains because of stare decisis. And, and they described the FTC um, in a way that was, might, may be true, probably not true in 1935, certainly not true today. If now was the time that the FTC said, you know what, let's throw it out there, we're going to go guns blazing and we're going to try to remake antitrust law. Um, that would be the case, and that would be it. It would go to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court would say, this is no longer an independent agency. We want to make sure that the political leadership, elected political leadership, is in favor of what's happening right now so that someone can be held accountable for this. Um, so Axon is going to be a step on that. That's a little bit more nuanced. That's the double for cause. That's the free enterprise fund version of this. But the bigger question, uh, which has almost been superseded uh, by Sale Law and Collins, 
is what happens to Humphrey's executor, and the more aggressive the FTC is, the more likely it is that the court, that the court um, in a 6-3 decision, says Humphrey's executor is gone, with the Chief Justice writing. Um, Henry, Henry, maybe maybe you can answer this, and maybe it's not appropriate. Well, why do you think the FTC, I mean, I, I tend to agree with this. Why, why, is the FT, why do you think the FTC right now is pushing in this way, in this environment where the Supreme Court is, host, is you know, growing increasingly hostile to admit, what, 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 why would the FTC, what is it sensible? Why, is the, why do you think the FTC is? Do you have any thoughts on what, what is driving this, this um, sort of a, this a push at the FTC now? Did, did they think they'll be successful, or what, what's going on here? I'll be honest, I, I don't know, and I, I don't want to speculate. I mean, I think, as we've heard today, rulemaking takes time, mm -hmm. right? And so one big question on the table is, even, is whether it could even be done mm -hmm. in the current administration, mm -hmm. right, before voters go back to the polls. So. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think there was some thought where they, at least on the, the when they amended the Mag Moss rules that they could get rulemaking done in a year, but that seemed seems insanely unrealistic to, to me, having worked on some consumer protection rules, one that took five years to um, to promulgate. Um, well, just, just to add to that, just to go back to the bigger picture, I, I think uh, historians of antitrust will view this as a, as a very interesting period because we, we have this substantive divergence between what antitrust uh, should be about, uh, and we have it playing out in almost every branch of government. And we sh and we shouldn't forget the on the table is the is the rewriting of the of the merger guidelines. Right. And that that could, it's there. It's actually there, although that's not not legally binding, but high, highly persuasive. There, in fact, the, the agency together with the DOJ could, could have a, a significant impact. I mean, those, yeah. I mean if, if the agency, um, I mean, if they were to do what the, the last administration did on the vertical merger guidelines and put it out on a partisan vote, I mean, it, they just won't survive. I mean, it, it'll, flip, it'll just flip-flop again, I assume, which is what happens every time they try to do something like that on a partisan uh, uh, basis, but I agree that'll be um, that'll be very uh, consequential. Um, and we so let's let's move on a little bit. I and mean, we've we've already touched on this, um, and I think we 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 agree there is something broader going on in antitrust. And one of the questions we we had discussed um, for today was whether the interest in UMC rulemaking and the and the relationship between the interest in UMC rulemaking and the antitrust proposals that are up on the the Hill, and this is part of a bigger a bigger backlash against the way that antitrust has been performed. Although I don't know that the bills on the Hill are necessarily going after the consumer welfare standard so much as the the process the the substantive antitrust rules. I wonder if um, I mean, do you do you agree with that? That for example, the 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 um, the preferencing bill that's on the Hill now that I think still goes with a consumer welfare standard, so it's not really going as far as the FTC, but it's definitely attacking sort of the process for bringing um, unilateral conduct cases. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's part of the same effort to detour around the, uh, the case law, and, and, and of course that, that would be, if it were enacted, would be far more successful than, than the rulemaking for all of the legal vulnerabilities that, that we've identified. It is, it is interesting that if you've, if you've looked at the evolution of that bill, and you, if you compare the Senate to the House version, right, the, the, the House version is, is like a per se prohibition, whereas the Senate not only has this material harm to competition qualifiers, it's got this whole long host of exceptions. And this is the same thing happening again. Every time you try and apply a rule-like prohibition to economically ambiguous practices, when you start working at this in good faith and negotiating, renegotiating, you end up back with the rule of reason. And I believe that was a comment made in the earlier panel. Um, even if that bill were enacted, it's not quite clear how different it would be than if the court uh, were just looking at it afresh under the, under the current rule of reason. If I could just um, mention one other bill, however, one of the merger bills that, out, that is out there would just simply flatly prohibit uh, acquisitions by, by, uh, by uh, any company that exceeds a certain threshold. Um, 
Uh, and, and that, if I just point that out for a second, that, that's a case where that, that would really have, that, that has devastating effects when you, when you divorce antitrust, anal, uh, antitrust law from any economic analysis. That would simply devastate the startup market. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the key monetization avenue for startups is through acquisitions, through platforms. Um, uh, and, and so, as one of the deficiencies, I think, in the alternative vision of antitrust uh, is that they have not yet operationalized how to achieve their outcome without causing potentially significant adverse impacts on the economy and on uh, consumers in particular. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Um, so let's uh, let's go back to the FTC then and talk a little bit about some of the internal divisions there. And Commissioners Wilson and Phillips um, have been a very vocal, especially uh, uh, Commissioner Wilson has been um, very vocal about her uh, uh, concerns about some of what's been going on at the commission. And they've expressed in particular due process concerns over uh, the majority's modification to the rules of practice for UDAP rulemaking and the issuance of what uh, these omnibus resolution enforcement resolutions um, last summer. And um, I wonder if you see any relationship between these actions and the commission's interest in, in um, UMC rulemaking and um, maybe if someone could also just talk about what in case the audience doesn't know what those omnibus resolutions were, were about. I don't think anyone can speak better for Commissioner Wilson than Commissioner Wilson can. Well, that's true. <laughs> quite frankly. Um, but I do think, uh, I mean, on both sides, the people really believe what they're doing. I don't think this is necessarily politically driven uh, on either side. I think if you read uh, Chair Khan's prior articles, mm -hmm. uh, she, before holding any office, believes this. Mm -hmm. uh, Commissioner Wilson has a very strong, long track record in antitrust, uh, and uh, believes uh, believes strongly in the in the process as it's developed. Um, I think uh, you know it's not a bad thing that uh, that we have Humphrey's executor. <laughs> that it's nice to. Uh, I think there's something to be said for uh, majority uh, the three three one party limit on the commission is not a bad thing. Uh, because uh, today's dissent, today's minority view, maybe tomorrow's majority view. I think uh, I can think of some commissioners that uh, that prove that out. I think uh, a lot could be said, for example, of uh, you talk about history. Uh, I remember Phil Elman's uh, Phil Elman's views of the Robinson Patman Act, for example. Uh, one time, dissenting views became very broadly adopted. Uh, so it's not bad to have those different types of views, uh, those views uh, excellent at the commission. Uh, personally, I, I have great admiration for Commissioner Wilson and, and, and her writings and her, and her positions. Uh, other people may disagree, but I think the fact that there's that debate out there is not such a bad thing. And to some extent, that's been true over many years at the commission. Y there's been different views expressed uh, by, by commissioners who may have a different view from what the, the majority may have. I think of some, again, by some of the opinions by Phil Elman, the dissenting opinions by Phil Elman demonstrate that. I think that's a good thing. I think that's positive. And I think that helps through the adjudicatory practices to build up a body of law. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's not that it's not partisan. Um, I see views on both sides. Uh, uh, we go back to the consumer welfare standard. Some of the strongest con the proponents of the consumer welfare standard, however they might define it, are, uh, as you indicated, Carl Shapiro, Doug Melamed, even Fiona Scott Morton. Yeah, I think. Yeah, they I, define I, I, it themselves. <laughs> these are not these are not card carrying Trumpies. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, so it's a, it's a nonpartisan view. Uh, I think. Uh, I think it's made clearly nonpartisan when the current chair uh, suggests that we've had 40 years of, uh, of non-enforcement. Well, that sweeps me under the rug, but it also sweeps uh, Bob Potofsky under the rug, Joel Klein under the rug, Dan Diggerman under the rug, John Leibowitz under the rug, need I go on? Uh, so I think, I think that, the, that the, the persuasion of the dissenting view is, 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 probably, a pretty, is probably a good thing. Well, I mean, some of Christine's 
um, uh, Commissioner Wilson's uh, uh, comments go beyond you know, substantive disagreement, and she's complained a lot about, um, you know, due process concerns within the agency that the, the non-majority commissioners are not getting access to, um, to, to, um, to, you know, to the same level of information that, that, that you know, in former, in former. I think she's got a very valid point. Yeah. Henry, do you have any thoughts on? Yeah, I mean, I, I've certainly read that, too. I mean, she's, you know, in some of her statements. And I mean, again, I, not being there, I don't know, I can't say, mm -hmm. you know, anything else about that other than that's what she says. And if, but if it's happening, I agree with you, I agree with Jim that, you know, it's not like, that's not a good thing. It doesn't promote, mm -hmm. you know, a, a, a bipartisan product. Right, right. I think so, it was with second re re second yeah. requests, although I never recall yeah. uh, non non chair commissioners getting <laughs> reviewing mm -hmm. second requests in the past. And yeah. I'm not sure, but um, in any event, okay, all right. Um, so let's 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 um, uh, let, let's finish. Try to finish up here. What is the relationship between the agency's proposed UMC rulemaking initiative and the con oh, and this was something that you had brought up, Jonathan, the conventional distinction between per se and rule of reason standards. And I think we've discussed this a little bit, but maybe you want to talk a little bit about um, that distinction, the relationship between rulemaking and the distinction between per se and um, per se and rule of reason? Sure, I'd uh, be happy to. Uh, so, you know, antitrust 101, we, we break up all potential offenses into those that are subject to per se liability and those that are subject to various forms of the rule of reason. And, and, and again, uh, not to repeat myself, but, but the, re the reason why most of the offenses are on the rule of reason side and there are various varieties of the rule of reason is again, because antitrust is hard and it's hard to distinguish between efficient and inefficient practices and you don't wanna make um, a mistake, see United Shoe, see Vaughn's Grocery, see Topco, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the, the reason this is relevant, or I felt it is relevant to the rulemaking proposal, is that rules would seem to be um, uh, best suited to cases in which you don't have the hard cases, to, to cases where per se treatment is, um, uh, is, is appropriate. Um, but that's only a minority of antitrust offenses. It doesn't apply to any of the single firm conduct. Uh, and so given the long history that the courts have developed in sorting out which practices belong where, right? And if you, of course, if you go back pre-Sylvania, the per se category was pretty crowded, and, and since Sylvania, most of it's been shifted over to the, over to the rule of reason. And, and, and that's consistent with a very large body of scholarship that tells you that all of those offenses that were shifted over, it's not appropriate to treat them under, under a rule like per se rule because most of the time um, they actually promote the competitive process. And so adopting a rulemaking pr uh, approach to antitrust enforcement would suggest that you want to revert back to those per se rules. And it's not entirely hypothetical because many of the writings um, by commentators who are sympathetic to the um, to, to, to the uh, agency leadership's actions and legislative proposals often look back fondly to the period prior to Sylvania and suggest an intent to revert to that period. We should remember that if you look at the economic data during the post-war period, it is a period of high concentration, it's a period of big companies, it's a period of slow turnover in the Fortune 100, in the 80s, after Sylvania, after uh, antitrust adopted economic principles, uh, we see a lot more turn turnover, a lot more entry of startups into the economy. Uh, and so I, I don't, I, for that reason, I, I think false positives are important and they, they can have uh, significant economic costs. Um, and, and for the same reason, uh, I think rulemaking is, is not is unlikely to be the best avenue to enforce antitrust um, simply because most of antitrust involves practices that are ambiguous, brings you back to rule of reason, brings you back to adjudication. Mm -hmm. So one thing we haven't discussed about it, the FTC is of course just one of two um, main federal antitrust uh, enforcement agencies and we have the Department of Justice and um, what, what do you think the impact would be 
on um, that relationship, which is at least was pretty dicey in the last administration, and I think it's a little better now, uh, on the cooperation between the two agencies would, you know, how would FTC, UMC rulemaking, you know, affect, you know, comp you know, antitrust picture generally, and given that the FTC has Section 5 enforcement authority, which I think we all agree, you know, is somewhat different than the Sherman Act in some, in some respect, would it make a big difference? Because, I mean, we already have Section 5 anyway, would it really impact the relationship? What do you think that would mean for the relationship between the agencies? Look, it seems to me that uh, they would really exacerbate to a great extent the uh, importance of the role of the dice of which agency land in front of. Uh, the DOJ does not enforce Section 5 of the Federal Trade Commission Act. Uh, the FTC passes a rule that uh, embraces uh, not only Section 5 but Sherman Act uh, principles making a certain practice uh, per se unlawful. Mm -hmm. uh, the DOJ brings a Sherman Act case. The principles under the Sherman Act uh, provide for rule of reason analysis. That seems to me to be very important as which agency brings your case. And I yeah, think that's so, not very and, good. And I think yeah. the 92 merger guidelines were the first guidelines jointly issued by FTC and DOJ. That practice has been followed uh, since then, and I think that's a very valuable practice. We shouldn't have the roll of the dice depending on uh, make the, make it become outcome determinative. I mean, that, that, that's a good point that I hadn't thought about. I mean, there's a clearance process for industry. So if the FTC passed a rule, you know, that, you know, affected the economy wide, would, would, would it still have to go through clearance? And, you know, whoever, would, you know, would, the, would you still have to decide whether the enforcement was going to the FTC or DOJ if the FTC had a rule that, you know, applied economy wide? I, I, I don't know whether there would be a clearance process that would even relate to that. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know <laughs> what, what would happen. We'll, uh, we'll, we know. might find out. Yes. Yeah. I, I mean, I think, you know, I, a, a challenge is obviously, you know, in recent memory, at least, right, you know, the FTC has used Section 5 to enforce the Sherman Act. So one question on the table is, okay, if you're going to do rulemaking, where do you go? I mean, what did, can you, is there some topic that avoids the Sherman Act so that you don't get into direct conflict with Shh. DOJ? Yeah. I don't, I, mean, know, I don't know what that is. Yeah, there, I mean, there's been a so, few standalone, right. they've been settlements, Few standalone right. Section Five settle settlements, mm -hmm. and of course the uh, uh, invitation to clue. But why would you need a rule for that? It's already right. yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly. All right. Well, I don't know. I wasn't here for the earlier. Are we taking audience? Do we comments? Think? Yeah, questions. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. let's let's. Okay, we've talked enough. Let's open it up. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh my good. You're all waiting. No. <laughs> We're in trouble. <laughs> So I wanted to run a hypothesis by you, see what, what you think of it. Uh, uh, to, to me, what the uh, Congress is doing right now and the way Congress is talking about this it, is not something new. This is the way Congress has always dealt with issues of this type. Or to put the same point a different way, the Neobrands Iceans are absolutely right if you believe that the job of an agency is to implement a statute in accordance with the intent of the people who drafted the statute. I had the misfortune of reading the entire legislative history of the Sherman Act. And it is so much garbage about, uh, oh my God, we're gonna become a nation in which everybody's an employee. We're returning to serfdom. This is just a new, uh, with these evil big businesses, they're all monopolies. Didn't, there wasn't anybody talking about uh, consumer welfare. They weren't talking, that their understanding of, of economics was as primitive as the understanding of the folks up. So uh, f first of all, do, do you agree? And if so, what significance is it that uh, what we think is the right thing to do, and I agree with all of you, the right way to do it is the way we've been doing it since 1975, but that is radically different from what Congress had in mind. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I've taken a look at the legislative history too, and I think actually, you know, to me anyway, the legislative history speaks to using the rule of reason. I mean, you know, in the debates that preceded, you know, the FTC Act, uh, you know, members were talking about, well, what's, what, is, what, is, what is unfair competition and what is an unfair method of competition? And the response was, well, you see it in the case law. 
you can develop it in the case law. And so it seems to me that if we are going back to what the, what the members thought in 1914, it is that, let's, go to, let's send this to adjudication. Let's let this new agency you know, define Section 5 right, through the courts. I think, it's, I think it's very clear. I think the conference report that came out is very clear that, you know, in, in noting that what's unfair in this circumstance may not be unfair in another circumstance. So uh, I think, I think um, the 1914 Congress very much anticipated a rule reason-like approach for Section 5. Yeah, I, I think you can, you can find almost anything you want in the legislative history. Um, uh, to support a big as bad as approach, to support a, a consumer uh, uh, focused, uh, competitive markets uh, focused approach. Personally, I, I, view, I view the federal antitrust law as sort of quasi federal common law. The judges, as they've applied the law, they've internalized economic thinking, they've applied it in a way that benefits consumers or seeks to benefit consumers, and they've applied it constantly to new economic models. We have, it, we have a, a challenge in front of us. We have digital platform markets that inherently converge on high market shares. But we have to be exceedingly careful in not confusing high market share with high market power and anti-competitive practices. The false positive error cost from getting that wrong can be very, very high. Um, and, I, and I think that ultimately is, if you, if you want to take it all the way back to the legislative history, I think the legisla legislative history on the Sherman Act is, is muddled. Historically, it's a three-way deal on a tariff statute, a monetary statute, and an antitrust statute. Um, and so I, don't, I, don't, I, I, I think the ground there is, pretty, is, is shifting. But, but we, have, we have a long history of the courts in good faith um, applying, uh, applying antitrust as a federal quasi-common law and, uh, and, 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 and integrating, I think, in a way that, is, that has mostly worked um, economic analysis with, uh, with legal concepts. So my question, um, first, Corinne Wong Irvin, I'm at Axon. Thanks for a great panel. I'll preface my question by saying I, I do, am not in favor of UMC rulemaking, but I really liked Lisa's question about what's the difference between that and uh, the, the deception. And so, especially in the non-competes area, and Jonathan's point was about, well, the economics is complex. But that seemed to be about the economics of whether we should have a rule or not, and presumably when you get to a rule, you lost that, right? So why can't there be a rule that says non-competes are unlawful for anyone who makes equal to or less than the minimum wage plus 10%? that seems like you don't really need any economics, and that's pretty simple. And I guess I don't see that as being that different than other agencies, you know, saying you need to post calories if you're a restaurant. Lots of questions there. What's a restaurant? Is Whole Foods a restaurant? Um, calories for self-serve, but we still have rules like that. So I'm just wondering, you know, I, I wanted to just follow up on Lisa's question, like why can't we, if we uh, accept that we lost the economic argument, have rules um, like the one I described, and how are those different? Uh, I'll take that. Um, yeah, I, I'm sure you can identify within certain subsets of antitrust um, areas in which uh, rule-like uh, laws um, uh, might be supported by economic evidence at uh, sufficiently tolerable um, error costs. So you identified another one where um, the, um, the, the economic complexity in non-competes uh, uh, derives from the fact that on the one hand, it, it depresses worker mobility and the cross-fertilization of ideas that benefits the industry as a whole. On the other hand, uh, not having non-competes at all can, can potentially reduce uh, investment in training and in R&D intensive um, activities. But you've identified a category uh, of the a subset of the labor market where that trade-off would, would, would not be, um, would most likely not be salient. Um, so I, I think, we, I think we, could, we could identify um, uh, uh, pockets of antitrust um, uh, enforcement areas where, um, where rule-like laws might, might, might potentially work. Yeah, but, but, but I think in the aggregate, I think the 
the, the economic literature and the decades of case law suggests that those are, those are going to be uh, fairly exceptional cases. I think we have time for one more. Uh, will lead to a decrease in uh, innovation. Um, one of the reasons why small companies get acquired is, of course, because uh, you not only want to invest in their, the idea they're developing, often getting bought out by a, bigger, uh, by a big giant or a big player, uh, but because you want to acquire their stuff. Um, so I'd be interested to know, is there any evidence for the opposite proposition that uh, restricting non-compete clauses or the ability to use them to retain your staff at least to a decrease in the long term in investment in startups and in innovation through that means. I, I'm, I'm not aware of specific empirical evidence. I myself have made that theoretical argument that, that the, you're referring to an acquihire transaction. So the acquihire transaction where you're acquiring a team for the personnel, uh, uh, personnel's talents and capacities that uh, those would not be economically viable unless the founders of the startup could, uh, could covenant not to move to, to another firm, if I'm understanding your question correctly. And that's precisely why the only clear exception in California's ban on non-competes is to the sale of a business uh, in order to facilitate that. So I'm not aware of specific empirical evidence, uh, but I am aware that it's, uh, I, I think most, most people in the, in, in, in the business community would agree that they do, they do play a favorable role in facilitating sale of a business, and the California legislature has always recognized that and has never touched that exception. Yeah. Great, okay, I think, I think we're, 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 we're time is up. Thank you all very much for, for a very interesting discussion. I appreciate it and thank you very much for including us.